please welcome Jonas Insana. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Guluru, for the very kind introduction and very helpful introduction. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here from all around the world. It's a great pleasure to know that so many of us in different time zones will be sharing a platform for the next hour to discuss all things Islamic pop. So um, I'd also like to just briefly offer a warm thanks to our colleagues in London and Karachi who have done much of the technical work to be able to bring this event together. Lots of work behind the scenes really hopefully make this an enjoyable evening for all of us. So as Guluri has mentioned, my name is Sana Alimia and I am an assistant professor at, of political science based at the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations at the Aga Khan University in London. Today, over the next hour, I am delighted that I'll be moderating a discussion with my colleague, Professor Jonas Otterbeck, who is also based at the same institute, the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. And as Gulru's mentioned, we will be discussing this topic of Muslim global pop stars. This is a part of uh, Professor Otterbeck's most recent research that looks at the phenomena of Islamic pop music or Muslim pop music, if you will, a terminology that I'm sure we'll get into a debate over what is the right terminology to, me, to, to use. And it covers specifically, his research covers specifically a music company called Awakening that has been responsible for artists that we may be familiar with, such as Maher Zayn, Harris J and Raif, and other smaller and uh, upcoming artists that are present across the world. I have to confess that when Professor Otterbeck approached me first and my colleagues had invited me to participate in the session today, I was intrigued and somewhat intimidated because as someone who looks at the politics of poverty, refugee studies, urbanity and structural violence in the global south, I double checked, was the invite really, really meant for me? And I have to say, I was very quick, however, to accept it, of course. And um, it's a real pleasure to be able to hear Professor Otterbeck talk about his work and anybody who has worked with him or heard him talk about his work, especially when it's music related, knows that we'll be in for somewhat of a treat because there's always something fascinating that we uncover, both about how we perceive, understand, and conceptualize the study of Islam and Muslims, but also something where we can learn something new about music as well. So we're really grateful to be able to hear your thoughts, Jonas, today. So I'm looking forward to the session. And I have to say, I was also perhaps like many of the audience who are here with us virtually today, as I was also intrigued on a personal level to participate in this discussion. As somebody who is of Pakistan origin, who has lived and grown up in the UK and in Pakistan, like many others, the, it, the entry into devotional music that praises the Almighty, the One, the Beloved, the Prophet, and his uh, and uh, other Imams, and Imam Ali, and other saints and other devotees has certainly been a part and parcel of our life worlds and our cultures. Whether you are pious in your day-to-day -day practice or not, whether you are a secularist or not, certainly the ways in which devotional music and poetry permeates our day-to-day -day lives is there and present. And I often say to friends of mine who are part and parcel of the non-Arabic speaking world, who sometimes are taunted in very harmless ways more often than not for things getting lost in translation because not having a demand over the Arabic language. I often say that many of us from Mali to India to Malaysia have compensated for this with the devotional music and their lyrics and their rhythms of how this offers another space for devotion. I also often say that for those of us in the context here, I'm talking about South Asia, many of us may be moved by the very powerful words of the Fatiha, the opening surah of the Quran. Many of us will also be very familiar with the devotional music of Lal Meri, the, the lyrics of the wonderful Sufi saint of, of Sindh, of course. I also remember a very intriguing and wonderful story that I was once told by a student of mine from the University of Peshawar, who told me about his aunt who was from a small village. And 
was also part and parcel of a growing group of people who were becoming increasingly socially mobile, upwardly socially mobile. But she was very moved, he told me once, by hearing the melodies and the words of the poet, famous Sufi poet, Bulle Shah, who, who wrote and spoke in Punjabi and many of his lyrics and words were translated into devotional songs. And she herself was a Pashtun woman um, and spoke Pashto and didn't speak Punjabi, but he, she was so moved by the music and the lyrics and the devotional music that she heard that she went to university just to learn Punjabi so she could be able to understand what Bulle Shah was saying and what he was saying to her. And of course, it is fascinating. Her story is fascinating. And the ways in which devotional music have been followed, have been used, within various Muslim communities globally is a really interesting point of analysis that can tell us a lot about the societies and the peoples who are moving globally, as well, about, as well as about the religion itself. Often music and devotional music becomes a strategy for coping with trials and tribulations. In other cases, it can be a form of cultural imperialism, some may say. One of the most poignant examples perhaps of the ways in which music has been used as a, as a strategy to cope with trials and tribulations and devotional music from various Muslim communities is a reference we can take from the West African Muslims who were of course enslaved and in the uh, 17th, 18th centuries and moved to the Americas. And here the analysis of music tells us a very, very interesting, complicated and rich story about music as a site of devotion, music as a site of expression of identity and the like. Today, Professor Otterbeck is taking us on a somewhat different route, but there are some common threads that certainly remain. Professor Otterbeck is taking us down a distinct and modern route and a devotional journey that is situated within a globalizing world that is primarily, it seems at the surface on the global north, Western Europe, Northern America, Australia, but it's also part of a globalized elite and others are also participating in this quite clearly. And Professor Otterbeck today will be speaking with us about his work on Islamic pop or Muslim pop, as I've mentioned before, what terminology should we use here? And his work follows this emergence of Muslim pop stars who distinctly position themselves as Muslim artists that are performing for a wider global Muslim audience for both devotional, but also it seems commercial purposes. Some of the artists that he engages with have become household names, especially um, figures such as Maher Zain or Harris, um, Harris J. And Professor Otterbeck, of course, examines Maher Zain, who has collaborated with artists in South Asia, such as Atif Aslam and uh, Salim Suleimani as well, Eclipse, who we may hear from uh, as the talk progresses. But I have to admit, much of what Professor Otterbeck looks at and some of the artists that he also looked at were quite new to me. I wasn't familiar with many of the, the names that were appearing on the screen as I was scrolling through and looking at the various YouTube channels. But I was amazed to see that the work that Professor Otterbeck looks at with the Awakening Muslim Music Production Company has had over one billion views with all of its artists, which means that they really are a group of people and artists who are creating lots of waves in the music world and also within the global Muslim world. So a number of questions have started to trigger off in my head that we'll hopefully discuss as the hour progresses. Who are these Muslim pop stars? Why have they emerged and when have they emerged? How come they are all, it seems, young-ish, handsome men? Where are the women? And how come they're singing in English, for example? And how different are they, if they are, from the music that I've referred to earlier of the Sufi tradition that's rooted in the so-called Global South? I'm going to formally introduce Professor Otterbeck now, and then I'll hand over with a few questions to open up the discussion and start the in-conversation. As Gulri's mentioned, let me just provide you briefly before I do that with a refresher of what the session will look like. I'll pose a few questions to Professor Otterbeck over the next 20 minutes or so. He and I will have a discussion and then we'll open this up to the rest of the audience out there who are joining us virtually for a discussion. And if you would like to answer, ask a question, and I have it noted down here, you can just email connectingwebinars at aku.edu. So that's connecting.webinars 
at aku.edu. So if you do have any questions, please, please do think of them. It's lovely to always hear from the audience, especially as it feels like a bit of a surreal virtual world when we are effectively talking into a camera. So it'd be really great to hear from all of you. Okay, and then at the end of the session, we'll kind of go back into hearing from a musical performance, but more on that later. Allow me first to introduce to you now, Professor Jonas Otterbeck, who holds a PhD in Islamic studies and has a very rich teaching and research experience that spans over 25 years. And Professor Otterbeck has focused on a number of things. I won't be able to mention them all here, but they include contemporary Muslim cultures, art and popular culture, especially music, migration, Islam in Europe, and new Islamic thinking and gender. His most recent research, as we've mentioned, is on Islamic pop music, especially the media company Awakening and its artists like Marha Zain, Haris J and Raif. And Professor Otterbeck also has an interest in music censorship and an artist's right for expression. Before moving to the Aga Khan University's Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations in 2018, Professor Otterbeck was a professor of Islamic studies at a university in Sweden, Lund University in Sweden, where he was also, prior to that, he was also working in Sweden as an international migration and ethnic relations professor at Malmö University. So Jonas, thank you so much for having the patience to listen to me for a few minutes and introduce your work. I have lots of questions that I would like to ask you. And, um, but before we kind of get into the depths of the topic and what you're looking at, perhaps for us, for myself, somebody who's a little bit um, uneducated in, in this genre per se, if, you, if you'd like to say, if you could tell us a little bit about the topic and introduce it for us and tell us why you chose this topic, what particularly intrigued you about the phenomena of Muslim or Islamic pop and what terminology should, should we use? Well, thank you very much for the introduction to start with. And um, thank you for joining us on a Sunday and um, World Music Day. Well, uh, if I'll try to respond to those questions, well, I'll start with what attracted me. Uh, thing is that uh, half of our friends in academia are failed musicians. Uh, half musicians are failed academics. So somehow there, there is an affinity here among between uh, musicians and academics. Me personally, I, I played guitar and sang and played the drums in small bands, which made me also curious about uh, music in the field that I was studying. Well, when I was working as a tour guide in, in Egypt, for example, I sought out the bazaars and found the new cassettes and discussed with people about music, try to follow the music of the day. I also uh, went on radio a bit uh, in the late 90s discussing music and um, a friend of mine or a, a becoming friend of mine who started up a, an activist group about music censorship heard that and invited me and also invited me to a conference and, um, and I was thinking about what can I contribute with. So I looked into Islamic theology of the age old discussion about music and Islam and I did a couple of papers of that. And because of that, I ended up in Rotterdam. Don't ask me why, but in 2008, and an Eid festival, uh, giving us a talk about um, censorship and music. And on that specific occasion, Awakening, the company that I now have studied for quite a while, they were present and I met the CEO and we traded cards. And eventually uh, I found that card again when I realized that this music is keep coming up, keep popping up in all different kinds of context that I move around with. So I sent him an email and we started negotiating about the possibility of me taking part in tours, uh, even sort of riding in the tour bus and hanging out with the musicians as a field work. And uh, because uh, Sharif Bana is a very, kind and an open-minded person. He talked to the other ones and invited me in. And I've been on a couple of tours since and have seen them, these musicians interact with audiences, been touring, sitting in the bus with them and discussing about the ph them and about the phenomena. Uh, so that sort of opened the field, a very fascinating field. I, actually, I didn't know what to expect, but then again, that's very often the, the, the most interesting studies start like that. You have no clue where this is going to take you. 
and you realize that, oh my God, this just opens a world. In this case, uh, the four people who started Awakening and some of the musicians are highly trained in Islamic studies. So instead of just discussing music and, and the why you have a five string bass or, or whatever, why you have really interesting uh, gear for your, for your hearing when you, when you play live. I mean, I was able to discuss uh, Ottoman Empire iconography with Masoud Curtis, for example. Uh, Sharif himself, he has a PhD from Al-Azhar in Sharia, and one of the other guys has a master in Sharia. So uh, these are highly qualified people, and they're also connected to Islamic scholars who they discuss. They don't go and seek advice and fatwa. They don't have a, a, a Sharia council or a Sharia board for the company. No, they meet with these people that they have studied with in, in a very open way, discussing with them about what they're thinking, about doing, and ask their opinion. Not their opinion as a, a, a scholar saying, giving a fatwa, but asking their opinion to be able to form their own opinion. So what I eventually realized was that this was a really interesting field for someone doing Islamic studies because it really brought certain questions to the fore that I've been interested in before. You mentioned that I've, I've studied Islam in Europe and migration. And at some conferences, uh, a bit to provoke, yes, I agree, uh, but also because it's partly true. I've challenged people who, who study uh, so-called progressive Islamic thinkers by saying that, well, the youth that I study, they're far more progressive than that. They're actually way ahead of the progressive thinkers, and not because they are, are failing to, to respond to Islam or just do whatever they want. No, because they're actually progressing thinking while living it. So their embodied Islam is very often more progressive in many ways. And they have taken this music to their hearts. So these, this company is in a really intriguing position where they communicate with a rather young audience, but also a growing audience. Some of, of their audience are definitely middle age, And they're doing that in dialogue with people who really know Islamic law. And they also themselves are experts. I mean, when Sher Sharif, for example, who is the CEO, did his PhD, it was exactly on what he's producing, on entrepreneurship, on the understanding of ecology, the understanding of culture in this here and now. So- Can I ask you just to tell me, just, just to kind of come in there. So who is, so Sharif is one of the founders of the company, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and he went, he went, because you've got a really fascinating story about how the company was founded. I, I know because I've read some of your works. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, so basically these are this kind of like, it's a young, clearly intellectual and informed group of people who are situated in, in Europe in this context, in North America. And, you know, what's the motivation? They see a niche to kind of like produce Muslim pop music and who's their audience? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, a couple of them, uh, there are four of them, three from Britain and one from the US. Um, and the three from Britain, I know a little more about their background. They used to hang out in, on Islamic conferences because some of their parents were engaged in this. And they were the young ones. And they had to find ways of, of responding to what was happening on the lectures. So one of the things that Sharif started doing was already at 16 to write a biography of Muhammad targeting uh, teenagers. And his father encouraged him, but, but it was difficult to find a publisher. So then when he was a student, when he was in his 20s, he and a friend said, no, let's, let's publish this ourselves. But they had an idea that the small print publishing that we have seen, anyone who has lived in Britain, for example, I've seen quite a lot of it, Muslim small print publishing, was very often going for the cheapest option. So they decided, no, this should be good design and it should be on good paper. Everything that we do should be quality. And that was the start of it. They wanted to bring that kind of quality thinking 
and uh, also entrepreneurship without even formulating it as entrepreneurship. They wanted to bring that spirit into Islamic activism, basically. And after a couple of years, they engaged in music, but not from the very start. So then they start to kind of engage in music and they've had, they've produced really massive, they've been game changers in, in yeah, a way. Yeah. They've really been game changers. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of um, tell us a little bit about the music where, when it started, because it's kind of got a really big audience, even from the beginning, even from pre kind of, you know, YouTube age as well. So I was wondering if you could just plot a little bit, some of the big names who were kind of, quite who kind of shot up to fame a little bit within this story definitely and and it's interesting i mean when we let, let me give an academic angle to it because it's uh, both you and i will when we have a word like um, game changer it becomes sort of signaling that now a trend starts and when does a trend start well it never starts with a game changer which means that you can then question was this a game changer so let's start with the game changer. First, the game changer is Sami Yusuf. And I think that quite a lot of the people who are participating in this seminar will recognize the name Sami Yusuf. Now, Sami, he grew up in Britain, uh, born in Tehran of an Azeri family. He's schooled in music, both by his father who's a musician. So he has training in Iranian, different classical instruments, but also piano and viola, violin, sorry. And... Uh, he was moving about in these circles, met with the awakening people and discussed, well, what can I do to contribute? And eventually they said, well, you could make music. I was like, oh, what kind of music? And they uh, suggested Nasheed music. So once again, they went all in with the production in a, in a modern studio digitalizing the sound, building larger soundscapes, because the music was there already. For example, uh, Sharif has told me that when he was a, uh, a student, when they had an Islamic activity, they would invite some of the Birmingham acts, for example, Ashik Rasul, which is a, an established act at the time, who uh, were issuing albums on meme records, and meme records can be tied back to uh, Yusuf Islam, that is uh, the former artist, Cat Stevens, who took the name Yusuf Islam as a Muslim, who started to issue some recordings in the 90s, not least because he felt that there was a need of some kind of activism in relation to Bosnia, what was happening in Bosnia. And he was reacting to the very vivid Nasheed tradition in Bosnia by recording three Nasheed songs. Now, in the Nasheed recordings, there were certain people in the choir who were already active Nasheed singers in the North American scene, who had come from the Jordanian scene, who actually came from the Syrian scene in the 70s of Muslim Brotherhood, activist, political Nasheed singing. So there is sort of people connecting it all the way to uh, what, what was happening transforming political music into pop music, which is really interesting. It's part of the book, you know. I mean, there's lots of details that I can't go into. But what happened when Sami Yusuf was putting his act on stage, I think that uh, one of the, the big acts at the time, Zane Bicker, who's a uh, South African who had been on, on recording since mid nineties, when he saw Sami uh, Yusuf perform in 2004, uh, he told me, when I interviewed uh, Zayn Bika, he told me that he said to himself, like, oh my God, is this where it's going now? Because it was bigger. And the audience reacted in a different way. When he played, the audience sort of said, takbir, and everyone said, Allahu Akbar. When Sami Yusuf went on stage with blue lights streaming, he was a rock star. He doesn't like being called a rock star, not anymore, but he was called that in British media quite a lot. And the, the people looking at him started consuming him like a pop and a rock star. They screamed from the top of their voices. And they stood up as audience and some of them danced. So they, they were sort of, they were using the concert experience 
but with a devout artist in front of them, which was a game changer. We once had a teacher, the teacher of teachers. He changed the world for the better and made us better creatures. Oh Allah, we've shamed ourselves, we've strayed from Al Mu'allim. Surely we've wronged ourselves, what will we say in front of him? Mu'allim, he was Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad Mercy upon mankind Teacher of mankind Aba al-Qasim Ya Habibi ya And you have some of these artists today. I think I was watching some clips that um, from just as I was getting myself into the zone for today. You have similar artists of this real pop phenomenon and real fandom, screaming fans, screaming oh, yeah. after Mahir Zayn, for example. So how do these artists who, as you kind of mentioned in your work, they do position themselves quite as, and I'm using the terminology that you use here, as these ethical Muslims and these ethical young Muslims. So how do they, um, first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what are these young artists doing? They're, they're positioning themselves as young ethical Muslims and navigating kind of a complex set of worlds and politics that are taking place. Yeah. That's something I'd like you to just maybe touch on. And then also if you can touch on, maybe you can start off with this. How do they reconcile that ethical Muslim with this kind of pop phenomena that kind of emerges and this almost idolization that's also taking place? Yeah, it's, it's truly interesting because what happens is that if you put yourself on a stage, you have a stage persona. And if you record your voice, if you record lyrics and you photograph yourself, and you even if you sell it commercially, you will have a persona. Okay, what kind of persona do you want that to be? A provocative one? One who unbuttons the shirts and dances around? Uh, one who provokes the audience? Well, that's a possibility but not if you want to come across as a devout artist. And that's, you, you touched upon what should we call this? Well, actually, when I discussed with Sharif, the CEO, and, and told him that, I'm, I don't know what to call your music anymore. And he just laughed at me and, and he said, well, we don't know either. Because in the beginning, it was easy to use Nasheed as the word, for example. But some of the artists were, were hesitant because Nasheed sort of signals heritage to a genre a, a religious genre that goes way back. And some of them were, were making R&B or reggae or general pop or ballads. So they were uncomfortable with it. But what I can see is that they do music that has the pretension to come across as Islamic or in, could be included in Islamic, in, in what can be considered Islamic, which means that if you construe a persona to that, you have to abide to certain rules. Uh, one of them is how to, to deal with the fact that if you put a body on stage, there is a tendency to sexualize bodies on stage. Any female artist can tell you that, but most male artists can tell you that too. So they would have to negotiate their masculinity. And as you pointed out, several of them are young. There are handsome young men. So how would they negotiate the reaction of the female audience, for example, who might come there to consume them as a pop star, to scream. And uh, I've, when I've, I've been at concert, frequently heard young women scream from the top of their voice, I love you, Maher, like, like that, and, and really sort of try out the fangirl scream. Now, what they do is they, they um, do not dance on stage, not very much. They might sway. There's been a change since 2014, I'll come back to that. But they, they dress, well, they, they look like a university professor quite often. They have their jacket on, they have their shirt. In Mahasain's case, he always has a cap on. And they do not move about, and they do not flirt with the audience in that way. 
Uh, they might flirt with the audience in a way that they invite them. They, uh, like Maha comes on stage and said, let's enjoy ourselves in a halal way, of course. And then after a while, say, please, sisters, no screaming. Now, that, that kind of negotiating, while still coming across as young and handsome, goes on all the time. And that goes into the lyrics. That goes into the persona that they build up in their engagement. They're engaged. Almost all artists, or I would say, or, or let's say all artists engaged in charity work, for example. Um, please. Yeah, no, I, I was going to kind of like come in there because I think it's, I mean, it's really interesting how these personas get created and how this fan, I mean, and you could almost kind of replace these figures with kind of your figures of Christian pop rock bands as well, right? As these kind of like, as you see in the US with these, um, very ethically kind of like wholesome lifestyles, if, if the word is, is, is right to use. Um, and, it, and it's interesting to see, to see that kind of like taking place. I, I kind of wanted to shift, shift the conversation just a little bit specifically to about what you've just briefly, you mentioned it just almost in passing, but I thought this was really interesting about how what types of music that they're producing and um, some of us will be familiar who are on the call and some of us are on this on this conference um call and some of us won't be but they they are producing music that's primarily is there a particular language i mean a lot of the artists that i found were singing in english and they're singing these very kind of you know lifestyles about marriage or about finding the perfect spouse or perfect spouse in heaven or perfect spouse or, um, you know, in this world to get to heaven or they're talking about nature. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, like if you could give us an insight as to what languages they're, write, uh, they're singing in, what some of the lyrics are telling us, and then to bring it to this broader discussion around kind of, you know, how, how different or how new is what they're doing, doing, right? How new is it? Yeah. Well, language-wise, there, there are local groups all over the world right now. So there will be any conceivable language. There will be Central Asian languages, there will be, well, Indonesian, Malay is big language, Chinese acts you will find. Some of them will sing in one language only, some of them will change languages in one song. Mahazain, for example, I think he has recorded in seven or eight different languages uh, because he's tremendously popular. So he might make a Turkish version of a whole album, or he might have a song where he switches between four different languages in one song, also sort of signaling this global connection between different Muslim groups. So um, depending on which act it is, some, some acts only sing in Arabic, for example. Um, and, and even the, like, for example, on Awakening, so Humud, for example, he, he would sing only in Arabic. Uh, still those songs, have become really popular in Malaysia for some reason. Brought the light through your guidance. Peace be upon you, my beloved. Ya Habibi, Ya Muhammad, Ya Nabi, Salam alayka, Ya Rasul, Salam alayka, Ya Habib, Salam alayka, Salawatullah alayka, Ya Nabi. Yes, it was mainly like on kind of, you know, what language that they're kind of like thing which you've covered, but also how are they kind of they're positioning themselves through these different um, narratives of the lyrics, really the content of their lyrics. Yeah, yeah. How is it devotional? Is it devotional or is it 
is it a mixture? Because certainly some of the lyrics of kind of these artists are about devotion, Ya Habib, Ya Rasulullah, all of these things. And then others are about kind of, you know, as you said, kind of finding the perfect wifey or finding the perfect spouse or living um, with kind of a bit of heaven on earth, or they may be about nature. But I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. Well, there are some topics that are recurrent. So typically uh, there will be the songs where the person sings about his devotion to God or Allah. Um, actually, both words are used. Uh, or quite often there will be devotional songs to Muhammad, uh, the chosen one. Uh, he'll be addressed with, with all the classical ones, Mustafa, Habib, and all these things. Uh, the poem, al Burda, is frequently taking parts of a Burda or or well, sections of it, and put into pop songs, for example. So, um, apart from then that, you can also find songs about Islamic characters, apart from Muhammad. So that they'll sing about Omar, they will sing about any of the other strong Islamic characters that it's about. Um, but then there are songs um, about themselves, they're about their own lives. So there are two, basically... Things. There's either the celebration of Islamic lifestyles. Um, so you would say that, and those are very often um, interlaced with ideas about doubt. So it'll be like, I have done this or that, I, I feel this or that regret, or I'm uncertain in my role, but when I learn to trust in Allah, or when I did this, when I did my prayer, I sort of resurrected my faith, or I know that Allah is by my side, that kind of, of, uh, of observation. There's also love, love of spouses, daughters, mothers. As you said, many of the artists are male. Yes, that was one of the aspects that I lost. Locally, there are quite a few um, uh, female singers, and I'll, I'll return to those. Um, but these topics, they, they are recurrent. And then, of course, there are the other topics that are not connected in that easy way. So, so for example, a recurrent topic is politics, about freedom, very often sort of general stuff, like we want freedom, uh, I want people not to be oppressed. And if it's concrete, it's often about Palestine. Many artists have one song at least about the Palestinian suffering, quite often about Palestinian children's suffering. The Muslim imaginary and the positioning of Palestine within there, of course, is kind of something that features then within kind of the lyrics that are emerging from these artists. Exactly. Um, there, let me interrupt there. There's also another aspect of the lyrics. There's a functional aspect. If, you, if you're a commercial act and you want a concert at a charity gig or an, an Islamic conference, well, depending on which time of year it is, you might have an Eid song, you might have an... Uh, a song about um, a, a Milad and Nabi song, things like that. So you cater for the audience in that way. So right now there is, has been sort of a flood of release of Ramadan songs in pop genres. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, that's, it's, it's, it's fascinating, fascinating to hear it. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to just invite the audience. I won't hand over just yet to the audience, but I will really remind the audience and, and really invite you, you're more than welcome to, to join us in this conversation. If there is a really specific question that you would like to ask uh, Professor Jonas Otterbeck, then please do. A reminder that you can just email connecting webinar, so C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-N-G dot W-E-B-I-N-A-R-S at A-K-U dot E-D-U, connecting webinars, connecting dot webinars at A-K-U dot E-D-U. If you email any questions, we'll be happy to take those. Um, so I'll allow a few minutes to have those uh, questions come in. Um, but I'll um, take, yes. Sorry, yeah. There are two things floating about that I, I haven't answered that I should answer. Yes. You asked me about musical styles. That's an easy one. Anyone, any musical style. It could be, from traditional styles, uh, quali, to uh, rock. So 
any conceivable style. And if you're a local artist, you're bound to, to um, flirt with local traditions. It's very common. When it comes to female artists, I, I mentioned that there are, are quite a few around, but the, 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 the best-selling artists who are in the devote genre, they tend not to be female, but there are a few exceptions. There's an upcoming act in, uh, in, um, in the US, Muna Haidar, who's been very, very popular. And then there are the acts who do not sing songs that are devout in any way. They're love songs about a partner or whatever. Uh, they simply sort of avoid certain topics about drugs and sexuality, etc., and they dress in modest fashion, for example. So there's a, a celebrated um, uh, artist from Malaysia called Yuna, and another one called Sheila Amiza, who is very popular in China, for example. Both of them veiled, both of them wearing the, the trendy sort of modest fashion but singing uh, R&B songs in American style. Yes, I mean, I could go on and you and I could probably go on, but we are kind of pushed a little bit for time and we've got some oh, yeah. audience questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to pose the first one to you. And one of the questions that's coming in from the audience is that given that Islam allows some form of music, why does the modern Islamic music sound more like mainstream music? So I'm not sure who that's from. There's no name, but I do thank you for your question. Anyway, it's a great question. I mean, uh, as that person probably is aware of, there's a long discussion going back all the way to the, the earliest forms of trying to rationalize what the Quran uh, in different ways said or the Hadith implied. And music has been part of it. And there has been very many different positions, and I ca can't basically not go into it, each and every one. But um, what has happened recently, or rather, when music has changed the position in society by being recorded, recordable. I mean, pr prior to recorded music, music had another function. So recorded music and eventually then computerized music, digitalized music, where everything can sound music-wise, has changed the position of music, which has also caused Islamic intellectuals to revisit the discussion and reposition. And um, in the, for most part of the 20th century, most Islamic scholars were pretty negative to pop music or popular music or any kind, because it was seen as the territory of the secular elite. But eventually from the 60s and onwards, there grew a discourse on, well, if we would make music that was positive to Islam, which position would that have? Eventually a, a, um, a concept like al-fan al-hadif, which basically means purposeful music emerged. And now you will find quite a lot of, of scholars, even senior scholars who argue that, well, if the music is positive, the old idea about strings instruments being forbidden or certain wind instruments being forbidden is trumped by the positive message. So for the good of it, the old discourse that all music is basically from Satan and we should avoid it is still there and it's strong, especially among the Salafis and in Saudi Arabia. But the other, other discourse is even stronger. So the allowing discourse and saying that, well, we can use any, any technique. We can use film media. We can use modern music of all kinds of genres. Anything goes as long as the positive message is there. Then, of course, there are, are fingers of warning of celebrity culture, etc. raised. And that ties back to the ethical masculinity. The ones who are on the stage, they know that they are um, scrutinized, and rightfully so. I mean, they have a pretension about their religiosity. They're scrutinized. They better be the real deal. Okay, so I'm going to shift on to another question, which is taking us to a different, different area. 
Question two, which is somewhat of a comment, but I think we can also interact with this, um, comes from the audience who says, and I quote, it's a pity that in places like Tower Hamlets, music is not valued in schools. Muslim parents don't want their children studying music, end quote. So that's a comment slash uh, question, perhaps, that's come in from the audience. I, I think it's a fair question, because even in, in Pakistan, uh, I've seen um, uh, material from schools, for example, where they are very generous of, of giving hadith that are negative to music, including the one that probably some of you know about molten lead. Uh, if you listen a lot to music, you will have molten lead uh, poured in your ear in hell. Uh, that, of course, can scare any child and should. It's a, it's a horrible threat. Um, but then again, there's the, the positive mark. I mean, if you look at Islamic conferences, and I've been to quite a few uh, since the mid-90s. In the mid-90s, the ones that I went to, very rarely music, and if there was anything, it was a very simple act. Nowadays, they invite artists who will bring on a full show with musicians. And some of the people are the same. They're still there 30 years later arranging conferences. And it's all over the world. So young people who engage now in Islamic movements, in Islamic thought, or just go to an Islamic uh, environment because they're curious, they will meet these acts. And that will be part of normality for them. So parents who, for example, have this attitude in a migration uh, diaspora, these parents are often in a very hard situation about negotiation of morals uh, because they're not backed up by the majority society, either the majority society they live in or the majority society that they once came from. That's not an easy task to raise a child. You have to reflect a lot and all solutions will not be great solutions. Great. Thank you, Jonas. Um, we have a, another question that's coming in from the audience, which shifts again the topic to a broader historical one. The question is, do the roots of Islamic music go back a thousand years to the Fatimid era? Oh, well, yes. lovely question. Uh, I would say that it goes back further way back because music never starts or ends. And uh, in the Fatimid area, you find, uh, let's take Ikhwan al Safa, for example, who sort of either were uh, connected to Ismaili groups or at least were inspired by Ismailism in, in different ways. If you look at their tract on music, it's very much in depth to Greek Hellenistic thought. So there, there is a, a continuity in the Hellenistic area in the discussion of music, a certain kind of musical instruments, certain kinds of tonal language. So it's difficult to either say that it starts with the Fatimid uh, or that the Fatimid period was unimportant or anything, because it wasn't. The Fatimid period was, of course, important for music, not least for music philosophy as we know it. The problem is that when it comes to, to practical music, we will have to go to uh, the Tabakat books on musicians and try to fish mu sort of descriptions, biographies out. But that's a continuity. There's a continuity from, from the earliest period of Islam all the way through up until the moment when a certain book is written. There's no sort of specific area that lacks music or has an abundance of music. But court, we know that, that uh, uh, the court in Cairo, for example, had, had music. So it's an important part. Great, thank you. I think you've covered that quite nicely. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, it's a request to play some music. Can you play for us an example of some pop music today, that which praises Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Thank you. Well, I think is. that uh, we, should, uh, we should have done this earlier on, but we got so excited. I'll share the screen very soon here. Let's see now. And here we go. And hopefully you enjoy this. This is a song by... Um, uh, Mahazain, where he has invited Salim Suleiman. So they've written this together, and some of you 
would know that Sally Suleiman works in the Bollywood indus music industry and has an Ismaili background. <laughs> So that, that was uh, uh, Yahuda. I, was, I feel like a video DJ now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonas, for that. That was we, uh, then from, from Awakening, but together with Salim Suleiman. Yeah. And that, that kind of, of um, typical thing that you, you take a really well-known phrase from, from the Islamic vocabulary and you put that into music as a centerpiece. That makes it uh, communicable. So you, can, you may sing in a language, Arabic or Malay or whatever, but when the refrain comes, it's a very international Islamic language very often. So you can enjoy songs, if, even if you might not be able to enjoy the verses. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have another question and comment from the audience. Um, and I think this may be one of the last questions. We'll see how we are for time before we move on to the concert. Um, I'll just open this up. And the question is, thank you, fascinating talk. The talk reminded me of how the name of God or evoking the name of Ali is often used in Bollywood. However, that kind of music receives a lot of criticism. And it could be because of nationalism, especially in <coughs> Pakistan. So how does one respond to that? Is this pop genre only to be appropriated by the Muslim artists? I, I, I really like this question. I'll try to keep myself within the time limits because I see what the time the clock is the ticking. Well, uh, that's quite a lot of, uh, let me do like this instead. Uh, to signal that something has to do with Islam, you need tools. Those tools, let's call them resources, okay? Signals and symbols that you can use. You say a word, Allah, you show a picture of a Quran, you associate them with Islam. Do you have to be a Muslim to do that? Well, uh, you probably have to be a Muslim to do that with a liking of all Muslims. But there are people, let's say in the US, who has quite, um, quite a strong tradition of African-American Islam. Uh, some of them, which some of you might not know much about, like Nation of Islam or the Five Percenters, also called the Nation of Gods and Earth. And the Nation of Gods and Earth do not call themselves Muslims, but they follow Islam. And the um, poetry, which is the Nation of Islam, sorry, uh, the Five Percenters offers a really strong poetic tradition. And that has been picked up by Islamic, oh, sorry, by American hip hop acts. So if you listen to groups, very popular groups like the Fugees, they will tap into the Five Percenters lyrics style. So they will drop things that are connected to their understanding of what Islam is but they will not call themselves Muslims. There are also other artists who are, are, who are not Muslims, but who use these signs and symbols in their art, which really intrigues me because, um, for example, there, there is an artist in, in Turkey who writes Sufi poetry without saying that he himself is a Muslim. He associates with Sufism, Qadri order, if I understand it correctly. And he, he makes a sort of a, a certain find of post-punk um, post punk rock, but singing Sufi lyrics. So not all are Muslims, but I know that in the critique of some of these artists, um, some, some people would say like this, brother, I know that you think you're doing the right thing, and I really appreciate your effort, but to meddle with pop music is simply wrong. So even though 
you do what you feel is right, you're on the wrong track. So people will, will discuss this. It's, it's a really hot topic. And, and I suggest that if you're curious about it, just tap in these words, Nasheed, Halal, Haram, and you can spend months just reading on heated debate about this. And it goes, are you allowed to use musical instruments or can you do Nasheed music like pop music, but only with, the, with your voice? Well, some people think that. So Mahazain, for example, who likes to broaden his audience, do recordings both fully, uh, fully instrumentalized and vocals only. So he'll take the recordings to a studio and some studio whiz people would use computer technology to replace guitars, basses, drums with voice. And with, with a digitalized technique, you can take a, a, let's say, a sound like this, boom, boom, and you sample that, and then you lower it, and it'll sound like an electric bass. Now, if it sounds like a bass guitar, is it a bass guitar or is it a voice? Well, the pretension is that it's vocals only, but it sounds like instruments. Some people will be pleased by this, saying, well, we've, we've tricked away the instruments. Other people will say that well, it sounds like a bass guitar. It is a bass guitar, actually, even though it was not made by a bass guitar. And you can have an ongoing discussion about that. But the vocals only phenomenon is, is truly strong in some air some areas and where they produce sort of reggae and pop and, and R&B songs, voice only. Fascinating what technology is doing to shifting. Fantastic. Shifting, shifting our understandings of, of certain things. Um, I think this may be the last question that we can squeeze in, but I'll be told otherwise by our wonderful moderators who are doing a great job. But here's one for you, um, Jonas. How are young people connecting to this type of music? and how are they connecting this kind of music to the faith and using the music to connect to the faith? Well, that's a lovely question. And that has not been very much part of my research, I must admit. That's the next stage of the research. But I've been in the audience. I've seen how they react. And I've also talked to people who are volunteers. They make this music a soundtrack of, our, of their lives. I was standing talking to one guy. It'll have to be anecdotal now. Um, and we were in the middle of a discussion. Then he said, oh, my God, he's playing the song that I got married to. And he picked up his telephone, ran into the, the concert hall and filmed this while talking to his wife on the phone. And so he's playing our song. Now, that is an, a, a very clear demonstration of how this becomes soundtracks. They appropriate it. And, of course, the artist can't control what the music is going to be used for. That's impossible. That's why it's interesting to talk to people and ask them about what, what's your relation to this? <clears throat> and I'll give one anecdotal example from a friend's research, Johannes Fansen Schielbo, a Danish academic, who interviewed an Iraqi uh, woman about her music uh, listening. And, and she was pretty, a devout Shia Muslim who repeatedly listened to Johnny Cash, the American country star. Now, he asked her, why do you do that? And she said, you must promise not to laugh and poke fun at me because I really think he has a Shia thematic lyrics and he's a Shia personality. And my friend asked, what? What, what do you mean? Well, to start with, he's always dressed in black. And he was like, okay. That, that would be sort of a, a, a good way of, of an Ibn Ashari Shia, always dressed in black, always take the side of the little person, the suffering people, waits for a messiah, check, 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 deeply devout. And the song Dressed in Black is all about that. He will take on the suffering on the world. He will refuse to wear anything apart from black as long as the suffering of the world is like it is. That's a Shia ethos, isn't it? So she was consuming a Christian... Uh, drug addict uh, country artist but with a Shia ethics. She of course knew about his story because she was really interested in about him. So what the audience makes of art is not necessarily what the artist intends. I can imagine that Johnny Cash would be really happy with it though. I think he would. Maybe we should uh, 
pose the question to the bigger universe out there, <laughs> what his opinion <laughs> is on it. Um, another question that has come in is um, from the audience is what message slash education about music should the younger generation receive to understand and educate themselves about art, the arts and Muslim culture and Islam? So what message education should the younger generation receive? At school, in different places. I, th I think that music is an empowerment tool, but I'm positive to music. So anyone out there who's very negative will, of course, think me wrong. But I think it's an empowerment tool. Uh, to sing does something with you. To sing together with other people is a powerful experience. And I think that it is in us, and we shouldn't ignore that. And I think that a positive understanding, if, if you are in diaspora, for example, the possibility in a music lecture is to include artists that you really care for, that you in, identify with. The, the ethnic claiming of artists is very common. If I say uh, Salim Suleiman to an Ismaili audience, it's very many who know about him because he's Ismaili. So there's an ethnic claiming, or an, uh, in this case, religious claiming of artists that anyone who uh, has a Jewish heritage will be name will be able to name for example Lehan and Cohen who have a Jewish background Bob Dylan with a Jewish background football players who are idols are also so that there is something empowerment in 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 having these kind of public expressions as a prolongation of who you are and I think empowerment through history through the beautiful uh, uh, material culture that has been produced in mosques, in, in objects, or in music. That, that should be part of how we understand ourselves. Not in an apologetic way necessarily, but to enrich uh, what culture and humans are in relation to culture. I think this is really important. And I think that I, I'm looking at the time now. Maybe we should... Um, we yeah, we are. I have been given lovely directions from our moderation team, and they say that we have one final question now. So the final question is is now, and it ties in a little bit with this last question and what you've been closing off with, which is you know the role of the youth feature in this again, and how grounded are these Muslim stars, and can they be aired as young role models, as role models for today's young? And I think what you're saying about representation, about people being able to identify with you know from the Jewish context with Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen or with the Muslim footballers per se. But can you just end perhaps with, with some, some thoughts, if you will, on, on these young Muslim star, these Muslim stars and how they can be understood as positive role models, if so, for the young? Well, uh, we, we touched about the ethical persona. And uh, if you talk to an established, experienced artist like Maher, he really takes on the idea that he has a responsibility while some of the younger artists that I've talked to are slightly uncomfortable with that pressure. I said, no, I'm an artist and I deliver this. And of course I want to live a devout life, but to be pushed in to be representing something, uh, it's quite a mouthful to be responsible all the time, all the year around. Uh, and, and some artists like Harris J, for example, who started out as a 14-year-old recording. And I think he, his debut is when he's 15 or something like that. Possibly he turned 16 before it came out. And now he's 22. Sorry, Harris, if you're listening, if I didn't get your right, age right, but around 22. Um, and he really likes what he has done. But he also has other interests and want to expand. So now he has a double con contract. One with a, a sort of a friends group and one with Awakening to be able to, to split a bit, to, to uh, engage in different kinds of projects. So it, it is quite a pressure. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can only, only imagine. Um, I'm thinking now, Jonas, we are going to move on and our audience yeah. to thank our audience for so listening to the wonderful questions. And we're I going to yes, have a final word, of course, yeah. No, no, I'll make that transition because uh, what we're going to play you now is a concert from the Aga Khan Music Initiative. We have collaborated with, with them 
And the Aga Khan Music Program has offered us three uh, tracks from live concerts with the Aga Khan Master Musicians. It's about 13, 14 minutes with an introduction, so I won't do an introduction to it in that way. But you might wonder how this connect. Well, I'm interested in, in music that is staged. This music is staged. I'm interested in music that is, is sort of consumed in different ways um, and, and made popular. These Aga Khan uh, master musicians are, are celebrated virtuoso instrumentalists. Now, pop music is not necessarily that, but, but it is skilled. And it frequently ties in to traditional um, forms of music, as we mentioned before. So instruments might be used. If you take a popular artist like Sam Youssef, who started as the pop phenomena, he is now uh, making rather traditional Iranian music again, but with that form of, of uh, popular music. So it's sort of framed by the three to five minutes form. Now, I won't go on about that. I could probably do that, but I really want you to enjoy this. And I would like to have a caveat uh, when it comes to this, because I am sending from my computer and I've got a good um, Wi-Fi connection, but it is might be difficult for some of you to, um, to experience the music fully and completely in time. We have tested it and it works fairly well for most. If you can't, there will be sent out a questionnaire about this um, about this uh, seminar, webinar afterwards, and that will have a link to the music so you can enjoy it from your own computer if this broadcasting would fail. I hope it won't for most of you. So uh, I will share my screen and I really thank Dr. Alinia for this lovely conversation and for, for challenging, me, challenging me in different ways and our student Gulru for, for the fantastic introduction. So thank you for hanging in there. And now please do enjoy what I'm about to share. Hello, my name is Feiruz Nishanova and I run the Aga Khan Music Program. Today, we are delighted to contribute to this webinar and present to you new works and new artistic creations by the Aga Khan Master Musicians. The Aga Khan Masters is a collective of like-minded composers, performers and improvisers drawn together from the top ranks of the artistic roster that the Aga Khan Music Program cultivated and curated over the last 17 years. Together, the Aga Khan Master Musicians share a belief that a tradition can serve as a very valuable compass when exploring the possibilities for new creations that are inspired but not in any way constrained by the traditions of the past. This search has led to a creation of a new body of works that is strikingly original and you get to hear three of those today. I hope you enjoy this music and I hope very much that soon we will be able to welcome you to a live concert by the Aga Khan Music Masters. Until then, stay safe.
wonderful. So thank you so much, Jonas, for sharing that video and for sharing this wonderful concert. We're really excited and can't wait for the YouTube links to be up, both for the talk and, of course, for the music and the concert as well. So thank you all for your participation in today's event. And thank you, Jonas, for sharing your expertise with us. You really are a fountain of knowledge on this topic, and we're really grateful that you were able to share your thoughts with us today. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in this online and also who made the event happen. So I'll hand over perhaps to Jonas if you have a closing word or closing thought that you might want to leave us with and then I'm sure that we can end the conversation there. Well, uh, not more than uh, that I, I'd like to thank everyone who have been visiting and not least uh, Pesadenic Rasul and the Walkers for supporting the research that I am doing and I'm about to do. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful Sunday evening or what's left of it and a great start to the week on Monday tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.